Good evening. It is six o'clock on Monday, November 27th. Well, that was interesting. And um, I call this meeting to order unless there's an objection. Seeing none, this meeting is called to order. Councilwoman Harris, can you lead us in the pledge and the invocation and the pledge, please? At this meeting, help us to make decisions which keep us faithful to our mission and reflect our values. Give us strength, give us strength to hold to our purpose, wisdom to guide us, and a keen perception to lead us. And above all, keep us charitable as we deliberate. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Public comment, we have a public comment section at both the beginning and the end of the meeting. A reminder that this is not a two-way conversation. We will take your input, um, connect you with city staff if someone's available potentially. Um, but under our uh, understanding of the Open Meetings, Open Records Act, we don't have a conversation. Uh, Mr. Bell, please, you'll right here you'll have three minutes, sir. So first of all, good evening, city council member, and, and congratulations on your uh, re-election. So my name is Joseph Bell, and I'm a property owner in the uh, Five House Adams Park subdivision, uh, located at the intersection of Wallace Lane and Happy Hollow Road. I wrote a, on October 31st, I wrote a letter to Michael Smith, director of public works, and copied the mayor and selected city council members, Mr. Lambert, Mr. Hennigan, and Mr. Lenton. And in the letter, it states, I am writing the Office of Public Works to alert you to a growing public safety issue that severely impacts my property in the Adams Park subdivision. The underground water quality basin, AKA WQB, is the root cause of elevated and aggressive soil erosion near my house. I am very concerned about the apparent property erosion above ground, but even more terrified of the unknown damage that lurks underground. You see, this WQB has an inlet, but no outlet. This second page. So in that letter was also a link which showed water pouring out of the Jockton box manhole cover connected to WQB, causing significant erosion above ground. Over the years, this water WQB has collected thousands of gallons of storm water from all the five houses with no outlet. Most of the most of of Wallace Lane is on a 35 degree angle and the stormwater drain sits at the bottom of the slope and house number one sits at the top of the slope. My request to Mr. Smith consisted of three actions. Secure a personal visit by Mr. Smith and or code enforcement to witness the soil erosion at my home. Number two, request a written determination from the city of Dunwoody to state in clear terms that the HOA board is responsible for the perpetual maintenance, fixing, and repair of WQB per the Dunwoody stormwater policy. And number three, five years is too long to wait on a solution. That's how long we've been waiting for this solution, five years. And so what we're recommending is for Dunwoody to take over management and implementation of fixing this water quality basin. Only the city of Dunwoody has the depth and breadth of skilled contractors and engineers to ensure the water quality basin meets current you, federal, Mr. state, Bell. and local standards. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Ali Mahab, I saw you. I think he sits where I can't see you. 
Good evening, City Council. Um, off topic, I actually looked at the agenda and I saw that there's something later for approval of a contract of a video wall for real-time crime center. Granted, I just walked into this, but if it's exactly what I think it is, the city of Atlanta has one of these things and they're really cool. Like you can map out different things left and right with vid different videos. Um, and those things would be incredibly useful for the city of Dunwoody. So again, just kind of side topic, but if Chief Grogan's gonna come talk about one of those, I could tell you from seeing them in the city of Atlanta and seeing them in other places, those things are incredibly helpful. Uh, so the reason I came to talk to you tonight actually is as we grow as a city, um, we're starting to see more and more stress on Chatcom 911. The current system that we have in place is if you have an emergency or a non-emergency, everything gets unfortunately uh, routed to the Chatcom 911 system, which as you can know with the stress on dispatchers and whatnot is a little bit more difficult to be able to triage what's important and what's not. Um, as someone who walks around the city all the time, takes his scooter, takes his um, electric bike, I see a lot of things, different things have different priority levels. So what I would ask the city council to consider doing is maybe looking to potentially doing a non-emergency line. I think a lot of city of uh, Dunwoody residents would prefer that. It might still need to go through CHATCOM 911. I know we have a contract and there might be liability issues, but if we could set up something with a non-emergency line, that way citizens see you know, a, a car parked incorrectly or they see a um, vehicle that's blocking one lane of traffic or again, there's, there's different things out there where police you know, should be alerted to them. It's triage at the bottom. If someone's bored, they can go look at it. But to have everything routed through the exact same 911 system, I mean, you know, like I said, I, I walk around the city and if I see something, I'll call it in. And I mean, sometimes you're on hold for 90 seconds. If I'm on hold for 90 seconds, a minute and a half, three minutes for a car that's improperly park that's perfectly fine nobody cares last thing you want to do is you know as we grow as a city and let's say there's a potential bar fight at high street someone's calling in the police and they're trying to get in touch with chatcom and someone pulls out a knife you know it escalates they're now sitting in the same queue as you know someone's upset about something slight so anyway getting right to the point i politely ask that we strongly consider as we grow more that we look at putting in a non-emergency line um, so that when Dunwoody residents have an issue that should spark the attention of the police, it doesn't go into the same queue and doesn't cause a backlog into the main system where someone who's in dire need of immediate police or medical emergency doesn't have to have, it doesn't go through the same treaty system. So that's what I want to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes the cards I have. There will be another public uh, comment section at the end of the meeting. All right. Is it, who is introducing Jennifer? Michael, is that you? Yep. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you, oh. Mayor and Council. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The um, as you all recall, um, the city, the Dunwoody Development Authority, and Discover Dunwoody agreed to fund Create Dunwoody for um, on an annual basis for for over five years. Um, and one of the requests of the council made when when we made that decision was for the executive director or somebody from the organization come and give an annual report. So Jennifer Long is here to provide that report. I'm going to get her presentation up. Jennifer, if you want to make your way up and um, we'll both be here for questions afterward. Thanks. Good evening. Um, so thank you so much for having me here this evening. I will uh, just quickly take you through some of the progress that Create Dunwoody has made over the course of really the last uh, eight months. Um, we've been pretty busy focusing on uh, developing a strong brand identity for the organization, which means a new logo, a mission, a vision, uh, also outlining what our values are. Uh, also doing some pilot events um, around the city, activations uh, that are in specific zones around Dunwoody, including some workshops, events. We're also working on some exhibitions, but really with the purpose of driving economic development for uh, the city of Dunwoody. And then really, uh, again, sort of focusing on partnerships with uh, small businesses, corporations, nonprofit organizations, local artists, our educational institutions. Really, our goal is to foster a sense of collaboration and support. So, um, and in also in doing that, developing and cultivating new revenue streams. So we also went through the process of 
uh, outlining a strategic plan for the next three years. We've noted uh, here our mission and vision, which I, I won't dig into uh, very deeply, but do want to just acknowledge that we are dedicated to fostering a vibrant and thriving arts and culture scene as a catalyst for sustainable economic growth in the city of Dunwoody. And we believe in the transformative power of artistic expression and cultural exchange to enrich the lives of our community members, stimulate local business, and also attract visitors. So these are just some quick shots of uh, before and after of our old logo and our new logo. And we've also updated our website. So this is the before and this is the after. And what I'd love to dig into is some of the uh, really substantial work that's happened over the course of the last Honestly, four months, we were able to accomplish this in four months. Uh, one thing we started with was sort of focusing on our Indian community and celebrating Diwali in Dunwoody this year. And Diwali is uh, the Festival of Lights. It's one of the most significant cultural events for the Southeast Asian community. So what we did is sort of broke it up into a celebration, a three-day celebration. Um, we spoke with our friends in Johns Creek and they actually uh, planned a festival and their, their festival initially um, they were anticipating 4,000 people, they got 14,000 people. And so what we acknowledged is that certainly there is an opportunity to celebrate uh, the uh, South Asian community here in Dunwoody. And so we broke it up into a three-day celebration um, and focused on a number of different things, cultural, art, and um the first thing we started off with was a Rangoli and Dia making workshop on October 29th, uh, partnering with uh, the Spo Arts Center. And then Wednesday, November 1st, we had the story of Diwali, uh, which was a reenactment of the actual story so that people could learn a little bit more about why we celebrate Diwali. And that was at the Dunwoody Nature Center. And then um, a culminating celebration, a night of lights, which was a beautiful gala celebration at the La Meridian Perimeter. And really in doing so, uh, all of those events sold out. Uh, we also were able to really sort of focus on a couple of significant outcomes. One, the brand awareness for the city of Dunwoody. So I'll share with you in a moment some of the significant press that we got for the city of Dunwoody, Create Dunwoody, also the Dunwoody Nature Center, Sproul Arts, Stage Door, um, really sort of benefited from uh, just the energy that was surrounding the activities. We also had a significant amount of community engagement, uh, local business engagement, so small businesses and corporations. Um, the Rangoli and Dia workshop garnered 100 attendees. And I like to point this number out just for the sheer purpose of uh, the, the sort of dynamics around marketing this event. We had 1,069 event page bright, pay, I'm sorry, event bright page visits. Um, for the Rangoli and Dia workshop. The story of Diwali, we had 130 attendees. We also had to extend a wait list um, and people showed up anyway. So uh, we had a wait list of 50 and again on Eventbrite, uh, 12, about 1200 uh, visitors. And then uh, we also did the gala, again sold out. We had 150 attendees and about 840 uh, visitors on Eventbrite. And so these are some of the uh, sponsorships and in-kind donations, again, that we were able to garner in about uh, four months. Our goal was 50,000. And really what this entailed was obviously developing the sponsorship and marketing materials, um, establishing a corporate and small business prospect list, but then also following up on that and conducting consistent meetings to build a relationship, but also to secure sponsorships. And then uh, leveraging current business relationships and partnerships um, really in, in key areas. And so uh, some of the relationships that I brought to the organization, leveraging those to support uh, the work that we were doing. And then really, again, engaging local Dunwoody businesses and uh, nonprofits. Really, our goal, is, as I mentioned uh, before, is really to drive economic development. And that is some, some, these are some of the ways we were able to do that. 
Um, this also served as an opportunity to have conversations in preparation for 2024. And so in doing so, we've already kind of lined up support for uh, Create Dunwoody. Uh, probably most, most recently secured support from WABE. They will be our media sponsor in 2024. And so um, we're having meetings throughout the rest of this month to confirm and secure support for 2024. Um, and so this is just some of the sponsorship outcomes. Total number was 43,264. This includes financial sponsors, the in-kind donations, and also individual donations. And I just feel like, you know, if we had one whole year, you know, we certainly had a lot of energy around um, around this. But what I will say is some of the really pivotal sponsors, Assembly Atlanta came on board, Great TV, Third Rail Studios, uh, WABE, WSB TV. Of course, thank you for your support here with the city of Dunwoody, Discover Dunwoody. Really just a lot of people um, we're very excited about an opportunity to celebrate in this way. And so this is just some visuals of the press and digital media. With the support of 23 East Group, they were actually our press and communications in-kind sponsor. They helped us garner some pretty significant support from local media. It included uh, uh, print media, digital media, radio, television. We had a people-to-people uh, -people interview on WSB-TV. We also uh, had an opportunity to be featured on 11 Alive. They actually did three stories about Diwali in the city of Dunwoody. Uh, we were on the cover of the Dunwoody Crier. And again, just a few other sort of demonstrations of some of the press that we garnered around Diwali in Dunwoody. And then, as I mentioned, just the community outreach and support around Diwali and Dunwoody was, quite frankly, extraordinary. Um, we were able to engage uh, volunteers and initiate community building in a very special way, uh, a very authentic way. Uh, we saw so much support. And these are just some pictures of some of the individuals who really made this um, not only authentic, but just very, very successful. And so uh, Dipali, uh, Nandita, our volunteers from and from our board uh, at Create Dunwoody, just a, a number of people uh, were very engaged in ensuring that this was a, a true success. And so these are some of the images from that. And then here are some pictures from the Rangoli and Dia Art Workshop uh, held on October 29th from 1 to 4. And one thing that I'll note here is, again, you know, not only the outpouring of community support, but the diversity of community support. We saw all ages, all ethnicities. Um, really, it was just, again, a beautiful way for people to not only learn about the significance of Rangoli and Dia in uh, as we celebrate Diwali and Dunwoody, but also just to, to make connections. And then our story of Diwali, a forest walk, again, another huge success. Um, as I said, this was sold out. And, um, you know, for those of you who were able to join us, you were able to sort of witness the transformation of the Dunwoody Nature Center. And we partnered with PCE, which is a film lighting company here in Atlanta. And they uh, basically transformed the Nature Center into this really incredible experience uh, that allowed some actors from East by Southeast to reenact the story of Diwali. And as I said, we had a, um, a sold out crowd and people came anyway. So again, another wonderful demonstration of the enthusiasm around the story of Diwali. And then our culminating event, uh, the Night of Lights, a Diwali celebration hosted by our wonderful friends at the La Meridian. Uh, really, again, tremendous support around this, but we also um, tapped into some of the wonderful talent and community uh, surrounding uh, Diwali. And so we had the GT Bangra team, Atlanta Kathik. Uh, we had a wonderful visual artist, um, uh, Malika, and we also uh, have a local um, woman, her name's Sonal. She actually 
is a, she owns an organization called Tribe Bohemian Home, and she designed and outfitted the actual space at the La Meridian. And so again, many ways to sort of connect culture, community, local business, and the culminating night, again, was just a wonderful festive celebration of all the work uh, that was accomplished during the course of the week. And then one of the other things that we've uh, been piloting is this concept of art and sound. And so um, really it's an opportunity to combine two things, visual art and also sound. And so we played around with um, a emerging artist and an established artist. Uh, we Our first event was on September 9th. Uh, we had about 121 registrants, 115 attendees, the regular sort of uh, food and beverage sales at La Meridian on a typical Saturday night is about $2,500. And in doing that event, we garnered about $10,000. So there is definitely opportunity and energy that can be built around uh, this concept. What, what I love about it is that it can always be a different art and it can always be a different sound. And so we'd love to kind of play around with jazz and rock and folk and um, just sort of see what energy is, is generated around the different, different concepts. Um, and then our second event was on October 14th. And we actually uh, partnered with the artist that was Sproul Arts uh, Amplify a selection for this year. Her name's Charity Hamadula. And she came and did a live paint uh, for us as well. The other thing that we were playing with is you know, you using local influencers as a way to draw a crowd or a way to draw an audience. And so uh, the sound in this case was, um, his name's DJ Salah, and he has a pretty big following around the city of Atlanta. And so really just a lot of success kind of playing around and piloting with concepts in 2023 in preparation for what we are going to achieve in 2024. And so here's uh, our calendar for 2024. I just sort of put these in buckets. So Q1, we're gonna focus on uh, visual art and potentially do some pop-up art and film exhibitions um, in and around the city. And then Q2 will be centered around music. Um, again, kind of tapping into like world music, jazz, folk, doing something that's a little bit different. Um, and then Q3 will be centered around food. One of the beautiful things that sort of has come out of the work that we've done is uh, new partnerships, new collaborations. And so there are a number of organizations that have approached me about partnering with us to do some bigger things in the city. And so you'll see some of that come out uh, likely in Q3. And then Q4, uh, again, for focus on culture and um, do the uh, do Diwali in Dunwoody again uh, in 2024. And then I've noted art and sound that that will be kind of our cornerstone opportunity to connect with everyone in the community. And so that will um, exist in each quarter on a monthly basis. And then finally, this is uh, year two of our strategic plan. So these are some of the things that we'll be focused on in 2024, uh, continuing to expand uh, support initiative programming to support initiatives that promote cultural tourism, such as festivals, performances, exhibitions. Really, again, our goal is to attract new visitors and businesses to Dunwoody. Also uh, strengthen and diversify our funding base. So I am very focused on sponsorships and building resources and new revenue to help support the growth of the organization. And then um, also thinking about establishing an artist in residence program so that we can begin to build on uh, partnerships with local businesses and nonprofits. And then finally, thinking about how do we develop a plan around sort of a cultural district in Dunwoody to serve as a hub for arts and culture and all those fabulous things. And so that's it for me. Thank you so much for your continued support. Are there any Thank questions? Thank you. Yes. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Oh. Go ahead. Um, I, I would just love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts for a cultural district and what that might entail. Yeah. So that's a great question. Uh, what I imagine is, you know, sort of 
placemaking, places where people feel like they are experiencing, you know, uh, art and culture. And so, you know, right now it it feels like um, maybe the, the area where the Scroll Art Center is and Stage Door is a place where people sort of feel like they congregate to experience those things. Um, but I think it's one sort of observing. So it's me observing for the first year to sort of figure out where that might be and what that might look like. Um, and so I don't have sort of a definitive vision exactly where it would be, but just thinking about um, as we consider placemaking in the city, where that could be, where people just sort of, it resonates with people and it's a place they want to be. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm sorry, John. Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Congratulations on the Diwali uh, events. They look like they were well you know, represented. And we have a strong Indian community, which I know is the, the same aspect. Mm -hmm. um, your partnership with nonprofits and event making, um, there's an event that has happened in the past, was very successful and has maybe dropped off. Uh, Taste of Dunwoody was an event that was held here locally. It was very successful. I believe it was a partnership with Children's Hospital. Okay. And there's just a number of events that have happened in the past. If you could find a way to get with staff to see what those events were, to resurrect what was pre-COVID, to try to help them do some marketing, find ways to bring events back to Dunwoody that happened in the past. The one that jumps out to me is the taste of Dunwoody. Mm -hmm. So just, just an idea. I yeah. think what you're doing is great. I just figured I'd throw a suggestion out there since I had you. Thank yeah, you. I love it. Well, actually, I, I I didn't necessarily know about the taste of Dunwoody, but certainly something that we can reincorporate because food is actually one of the, um, it was an international food festival was kind of the con conversation that I've been having with this particular uh, vendor that is interested in partnering with us. Um, but certainly, you know, again, if, if there is someone who I can speak with directly about learning a little bit more, I'd be happy to do that. There's also a Dunwoody Beer Festival at Brook Run that was pre-COVID that's okay. also not going on. That was also run by a nonprofit. I believe it was the Nature Center for a few years. Again, there's a number of events mm -hmm. that I would love to see resurrected. And I think your organization is a great opportunity to help this community do that. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Anybody else? Catherine. I just um, had a question with the art and sound. Um, I mean, it says it's always in a in a hotel. Is there a reason why we're not finding a locale in Dunwoody that's not a hotel, be it High Street or in Park Place or the Brook Run Amphitheater, N Nature Center? Why in well, a hotel? it's not always going to be in a hotel. So, you know, again, we are piloting to just sort of get a sense for one, does this concept actually work? And the reason why we did them twice at the La Meridian was to one sort of um, see if it's if it's a proven concept, mm -hmm. right? You always sort of like do it one time, maybe it was a fluke, we'll do it a second time, see kind of what happens there. And so um, what I'd love to do is see it in different places. It doesn't have to stay in the same place. And in fact, I think that would add to the the allure of it is to actually have people move about the city in a different way. Um, really, you know, for me, it was testing out the concept. What does an influencer from another part of the city draw people? You know, does an artist emerging or established, do they draw people? And so I think, you know, going into 2024, that's given us enough sort of data to be able to say, oh, you know what? Yeah, I think this works. And so we could actually try it with, as I said, different art and different sound in different locations. And I think that also is a way to keep it fresh because yep. people get bored. Yep. yep. <laughs> so, yep. Okay, thank you. Sure. Catherine. As a board member, when you brought your big vision for Diwali four months out, I could not have anticipated this level of success. I'm very impressed with your efforts. The story of Diwali in the Nature Center was a lot of fun, a unique event, and then it was audience participation mm -hmm. and, it, and lights at night and moving through the park. It was fabulous. And I am impressed with your leadership and I look forward to what you're bringing us in 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Anybody else? Thank, thank you very much. And we thank look you. forward to see what's coming. All Appreciate right. it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, I'd like to uh, 
approve the consent agenda, but first I'd like to remove item number three at the, at the request of staff. So I'd like to make a motion to remove number three from the consent agenda and to approve items two and four. Okay. Second. Uh, moved by Councilman Hennigan, second by Councilman Price. Any further discussion or questions on the consent agenda? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, the consent agenda passes unanimously. Mayor, moving to the business items. Item number five is adoption of the road yeah. safety action plan. John, who's up? I can't see. He's behind the pole there. Oh, okay. <laughs> pull in, pull in the presentation. Sorry. Thanks. Um, all right, well, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Jonathan DeJoy again. Um, and we were here uh, last meeting giving a presentation for the Road Safety Action Plan, and uh, we heard your comments. Uh, those have been incorporated since then, reposted. So I would like to introduce Byron Rushing from the Tool Design Consultant team to give a brief just update on uh, on what has been incorporated since last time. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Dunwoody Council, thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. Um, and Jonathan mentioned um, we revisited the Road Safety Action Plan document after the last council meeting and made a number of changes uh, based on questions and some really helpful feedback that we received. I'm going to walk through that briefly. Um, I believe the final plan has been provided to y'all um, and happy to answer any additional questions that have come up in the meantime. Um, so I included a couple of overcap slides uh, just for anyone who didn't catch this previously. Uh, the Dunwoody Road Safety Action Plan, my firm was hired uh, in the spring to help the city uh, build um, an action plan that laid out a foundation for achieving uh, zero serious injuries and fatalities in the city um, by the date chosen by the mayor and council uh, 2034, which we've incorporated into the plan document. Um, the really simple mission of the plan and hopefully of the city as a whole is to save lives in the city of Dunwoody, um, prevent traffic crashes, especially those uh, that are the most serious, um, by identifying high-risk roads, uh, underlining community priorities, stressing equity concerns in the city, and building a, a guidebook of actionable strategies and proven safety solutions in a design toolbox um, that overall achieve the traffic safety goal as well as support city growth and priorities by being proactive on traffic safety in general. Um, additionally, this plan was written really to align with federal safety programs, including the federal Safe Streets and Roads for All program, um, and then be consistent with other documents that are uh, helpful in traffic safety here in the metro region, including the, re the Regional Commission's Regional Safety Strategy and various uh, Georgia DOT funding priorities and strategies a few of which we touched on in the action strategies. I also wanted to include the big numbers in the plan, uh, the crashes between 2017 and 2021, the five-year period that we chose as the best available recent data for using for uh, technical analysis, 5,541 crashes in total, of which 45 resulted in serious crashes. And it's really those killed or serious injury crashes that we focused on here. They're the most important for community um, that we heard from, and also they're the ones that really need to be achieved uh, for that that uh, zero goal of uh, zero uh, fatalities and injuries. And then finally, uh, we touched on some online mapping um, comments. We talked to the staff a little bit. We clarified some of the language in there, the number of pins, and then how pins were kind of layered with comments on top of that. It was really great feedback. I know that that feedback in a vocal community uh, can be hard and challenging, but it was really valuable for our process to hear from Dunwoody residents on what they thought was most important, where they wanted to see emphasis, and then really getting coverage across the entire city. Um, again, the top safety concerns we heard were those largely related to infrastructure design, designs that promoted speeding, uh, cut through traffic, or provided um, or did not provide safe uh, sidewalks for walking, um, bicycling lanes, and um, various other roadway conditions. There was a rig vigorous conversation at the last meeting on equity. Uh, we went back and we used the same equity numbers. The numbers themselves are not changed, but we chose to present them slightly differently. This again comes from the Atlanta Regional Commission's equity analysis methodology, which is uh, consistent with Title VI 
and Title IX regulations uh, for equity. Uh, and it's a little bit different than the way that some of the other federal programs present it. There's a few different ways to cut and slice that. But we felt this was most consistent with uh, federal guidance for broad federal programs, as well as the Atlanta Regional Commission's um, TIP Transportation Improvement Program for funding. Um, and covers the same core census tracts uh, for equity concerns in the city. I broadened the map out just a little bit to show the context. I think there was a nice conversation about uh, two census tracts that are shared between Dunwoody and Doraville, and then one that's kind of mirrored down into Chambly. So I wanted to show that context in the city um, and really emphasize that, that equity in Dunwoody is one largely shared amongst several communities um, in the North DeKalb and North Fulton area and really capture that more broadly. So hopefully that is clearer. Um, and presented a little bit um, more discreetly. And then finally, the couple of actions that we changed, we kept the action uh, plan format consistent. I made a few tweaks just to stress um, kind of the emphasis and priority areas in there. Uh, and that's been highlighted in the final plan. The institutional actions and equity actions, uh, we reordered them slightly uh, to uh, provide a little bit of um, schedule changes in there. And then really uh, in the citywide or systemic safety, the safety, actions that are applied broadly to the city off of the high injury network, but to general projects and streets elsewhere in the city, um, especially re related to speed management. We changed the wording on that to make sure that it was uh, absolutely consistent with uh, GDOT's guidance. And we reached out to both our engineers and our firm, as well as several GDOT friends uh, to make sure that language is specific to how that process works. So hopefully it gives the staff a little bit better guidance on how to achieve that. Um, and then reordered those uh, based on time frame after consultation with several of our internal engineers. Um, and then our uh, final set of changes were around designs and the design strategy toolbox. We went back and revisited the focus corridors and locations um, and broadened those out just slightly. We had set a little bit of a th high threshold upon uh, further review. So we broadened that out to give the staff a little bit more guidance on places to look. Um, this is not a, a assignment, but it is just a set of guidance practices um, to link the focus corridors and locations back through the countermeasures and then to some of the underlying risk factors. So the Jonathan um, and the Dunwoody staff have a better set of information for how to pick and choose uh, design solutions that work well for different locations throughout the city. Uh, so that's a very concise, I think that's our last slide. That's a very concise uh, um, set of the changes. I was glad that we didn't have to revisit too much. The data and numbers are all the same. Uh, the actions are all broadly the same for city adoption uh, with a little bit more specific wording and we're happy to answer any additional questions. Questions, anybody? John. Thanks for uh, the clarification on the changes. Uh, your report is pretty data driven, but I think there think may be things missing. Um, sidewalk counts, were they part of your report at all? If, we, if we're looking at all these projects, and I'm sure we have street counts or traffic counts on cars. Mm -hmm. um, do we have sidewalk counts? Uh, we do not. That was not part of the scope that we okay. were hired to perform. I will say that um, non-motorized traffic counts broadly, specifically walking walking patterns um, and bicycle patterns, is kind of the the golden uh, goal for us in the industry for doing safety, especially around safety for non-motorized or vulnerable road users. It is data that we would all love to have. And a lot of the really good data and the data tools are kind of just coming online this year. We're doing our first pilot project around um, Greenway trail counting projects as part of the DeKalb County Greenway and Trails Master Plan. Right. So I'm really excited to share that, but a lot of that is unproven right now. So I think the way that we address that broadly is to look at uh, that five years of previous crash data and project that forward and say, what are the physical conditions that are present that indicate a risk? And there may be a question about uh, coming back and looking at sidewalk traffic patterns in the future, but the underlying risk factors are the same, kind of regardless of traffic. Volume. I'm just trying to think of, you've given us a nice report. Yeah. The question is, what's next? Yeah. What are we going to do with it? What What's the implementation aspect of it? And I'm just trying to figure out next steps, because again, I have... Um, there's walkers, joggers, and there's kids walking to school. Mm -hmm. And if you would do traffic counts, they all have needs. They all have, want to be safe in their, their, you know, transversing the city. But I'm just wondering if there were any data helping me to discover what's next. It is definitely out there. And it's a, certainly a conversation we'd love to continue to have with the city if possible. All right. Yeah. Again, it's uh, 
something I'm worried about, especially I'm hearing lots of complaints about Chestnut and the Peachtree Middle School children walking to school. And that's it's highlighted in your report, but I just don't know how to differentiate North Peachtree from the other streets that are identified. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Rob. I was just going to tear off of uh, John's comment. It's something I mentioned last time, and I think it it sounds like it's maybe um, for our staff for next steps, but I would love to uh, overlay our um, sidewalk network with the crash data so we can see if we're missing like where our highest sidewalk needs are. Sure. Um, and I think that kind of gets to John's point about, you know, where do we need to do some of these pedestrian safety projects right away? Sure. And I'll actually clarify on that. We actually did that as uh, this past week as part of the comments that we got last time. Um, and we felt there was not a very conclusive solution or problem that we could identify from the data, but I went ahead and packaged it up in GIS and we provide it to the city as part of a technical memo. So they have the data, but in terms of putting in the final report, um, the crashes and the sidewalk gaps and the road network didn't quite align in a way that that had a real obvious action from that. So we've provided the data, but the city already has it. So, of course. Again, uh, thank you, Byron, Jonathan, the team. Um, when we talk about next steps, I, I know that there's, we're going to, is this going to be a collaboration between community development, public works that expressed in there is joint mutual shared understanding? Yes. Great, great. And um, I, I mentioned a couple when you were presenting last time, do we change, I know we have different design characteristics of different roadways. Uh, when a new developer comes in, developer comes in, you know, they have standards that this is the, the streetscape, this is the sidewalk width and so on and so forth. Um, for instance, slip lanes, D cell, A cell lanes. Do, are we addressing, um, looking at, citywide, um, those other characteristics that might not be in an overlay to see that we can address and say, well, we're, we don't like slip lanes anymore, or uh, we're going to remove them from our design characteristics, or when a new developer comes in, we're not going to ask for a D cell or an A cell lane. Um, are those going to be on the implementation next steps as well, that kind of look or observation? Yeah, so one other um set of um, technical memos that we provide to the staff was a fairly authoritative review of the uh, previous plans and policies that are noted in the plan document. So we have, it's, it's close to a 40 page analysis of those. Um, and in a few places, we made some key recommendations on where those do or do not align with kind of emerging national standards. In a few places where policies, there's not a conclusive direction, but there's a contribution to safety or maybe a barrier to safety in different cases. So the staff has those. I do think some questions like that take a lot more, not even just engineering analysis, there's different engineering directions they can go, but a, a political analysis on what is suitable for the city. Um, and I certainly hope those are conversations the staff and the, the elected officials continue to have. Thanks. And the last one that was all about the follow-up, the next step. So I know we've gotten some really great um, strategic plans presented to council in recent times, the Barry Dunn with the police. It's all about next steps and, and, and actions. And then when we hear that back from council, so I'm sure Eric will be working with staff presented at our, at our retreat or throughout the year as, as you progress. Um, so look forward to that. Thank you. Can I circle John. back? Yeah, there was a comment you just made that you gave a 40 page report to staff. Is that part of your report to council? Um, it's not included in the final plan. It was, it's highlighted in that, um, in the final report, the plans and policies, previous planning efforts, um, but the technical analysis memo is for city to access on. Uh, I just figure that if the city paid for something, it's the city and the citizens that are getting the copy of it. This is your opportunity to, to give it to us. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's an opportunity to forward that information to us. Sure. I want, if the staff could somehow find a way to give that to council, I think it's important. That Let me well, clarify what this is. Just yeah, maybe I, I'm not sure, but I'm trying to understand. This is what you recommend, what you looked at is our, you. maybe I'm wrong. Did you look at plans other than the transportation plan? We uh, looked at the list that's in the Okay. Road safety action plan. So it's several uh, city policies, uh, right? Ordinances so it's about like states. rezonings and require like driveways and not curb cuts and all that. That yeah, was what where, where those ordinances touched that we would then look at when those ordinances came up for review. Is that what you might recommend yes. if yes. we chose to proceed? Like so, if we were when we look at our comprehensive plan, for example. We might look at the 40 pages or the technical advice to see what we might want to tweak 
to meet our overall goal of improving pedestrian safety. Is yes. that correct? Okay. Right. It, it would probably be helpful for us to see that at some sure, point. We'll make sure the staff knows that. Thank you. Is that it, John? All right. So I have a question, and I know you touched on it a few weeks ago, which is, is that when I look at this last page of this of the PowerPoint, um, and you talk about the risk factors and facility types, and you look at the very last dot item, which is a higher socioeconomic vulnerability, lower average incomes, higher proportion of population that represents minority and non-white race and ethnicity. And then you go to the focus corridors and our poorest, most populated with underserved residents is not on this list. Can you explain one more time so I understand that? The focus corridors and locations is pulled directly from the crash data as we looked at it for a five that five year period and i'm actually really curious and we went back and visited this twice is why the roads and i think um i won't i won't quote one off the top of my head without referencing it but there's a several roads that run next to those census tracts that don't have high crash rates and i'm right. really curious why there was a fatality case. on the access road and yeah. i don't know if you exclude it the PIB access road because it's an access road, but it's only an access road to Peachtree Industrial. It's not an access road to an interstate. So I don't know. I'm I'm guessing it has something to do with the high volume of pedestrians. I mean, given that a great many people in that community walk regularly to get groceries, to meet the bus, to go to the dentist, what, wherever they're going. I don't know. It would be an interesting mini data dive for Jonathan, because to me, that's like the number one area, aside from perimeter for different reasons, that we ought to be focused on pedestrian safety because of the high volume of people who do not drive in that community. Mm -hmm. And so um, anyway, I just think it's interesting. So the data didn't show. Okay. Thank you. Anybody move, else? Move to approve. Move by Joe. Second. Second by John. Any uh, further questions or comments? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you all for coming. Item number six is oh. contract amendment to collaborative contract for senior planner physician Richard McLeod. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is a, a request. Uh, this is a, about the fifth time we've been back to you all on this one item. Uh, uh, Madeline Smith, who is our senior planner, is at Georgia Tech. She's going after her master's degree in urban design. Um, she is in school, so she has to lessons and hours. Uh, so we're back to, uh, she's now full time again. Uh, we would like to ask though, instead of bringing back these, because I think she's got until uh, December of 2024. Um, can you, could we uh, uh, ask the city manager to sign off on these uh, numbers? Uh, she will not go above full time, which is what finances off authorized. Uh, it's just going to be somewhere between 30 and 40 hours. So um, that's what we'd ask. Uh, has this been reviewed by legal? Yeah. Okay. All right. John? Well, when I say legal, the contract, yes, the terms are uh, subject to finance, so I defer to the city manager on the finance part. It's okay for us to approve this once? Yes. 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 Okay. Richard, thank you. I had a uh, question from a constituent asking, uh, she's taking three months off, she's taking the summer off. Are we getting a replacement? The part of the contract was for that funding, for that position, for that job function is somebody else picking up the slack do we need that person do we, do we not have that it. work why are we going to go with three months without that so, position should we should the contract be downgraded so our we're going to wait and see um it depends on how many requests for zoning we get uh probably around the middle of the spring um we we're probably going to uh at least cut the position down but we're also going to be uh, doing all the work on the comprehensive plan. So there may be enough work and they'll, they'll, they may have to replace her. So right now you have no reason to believe that you need to subcontract for that 30 hour person or 40 hour for the three months that you need it. 
We just don't know it yet. You don't know yet. And basically it's because of the way the zoning works, planning, you get a new high street in, you got to hire five people for the next cool. year. So, I mean, you, yep. you pull those in and then yep. you go bid it back and forth. All right. I just wanted to make sure that I understood because somebody was asking if the way it's working, do we need this person at all? So thank you. I think you've explained it. Yes. I want to clarify a couple of things. Yep. If, if we don't need to fill that position this summer, mm -hmm. we are not paying for that position this summer. Um, actually, if we don't, don't fill the position because, uh, collaborative will fill the position, um, because the, we did a firm contract for five years based on our projected level of work. Um, so. No, I don't really understand that. I have to be honest. So when we did the RFP. Right. They answered it and they said, "What What are your needs?" We projected how right. much okay. zoning and building we would need. So in Georgia, we have a law called gratuities. I'm not an attorney, maybe not, or maybe I'm wrong, but um, I'm concerned that if she's not here and we don't fill the position, I'm assuming her three months are unpaid from collaborative. Maybe I'm wrong, That's correct. and maybe I'm in the weeds. I don't think we discussed this before, did we? I might have missed that on this agenda. That might have been me, um, but Eric. No, I'm gonna say I'm gonna want to see that. Oh yeah, how that's worded because I thought it was a straight contract with collaborative that you pick and choose if you need her or don't need her, but you can't just have a contract just they get paid and they don't fill the position. And there's also got to be a determination convene for convenience oh, yeah. Yeah. in there. And I yeah. think that yeah. is in there. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm not a little worried about the gap mm -hmm. period that we're talking about. That's the part I don't understand completely. I understand that if she's gone and we need someone, they send someone. Right. What I don't understand is what happens if we don't need someone and they don't send anyone, what happens to the money? It decreases just as the that's what I was asking. Yeah, yes. Oh, you didn't under, uh, maybe I wasn't clear. Yes. So let's start over. If in the unlikely event, because I think we're about to get slammed in the next year or two, but in the unlikely event that we don't need anyone to fill that position, the position is vacant, they reduce what we're paying them. Correct. Okay. Never mind. All right. That's much clearer. Thank you. I yeah. should have asked it a little clearer. Anybody else have questions? All right, this is a business item. Move to approve. Moved by John. Second. Second by Rob. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vanicki, and Sharon has to read it, I think. Item number seven is final ARP American Rescue Plan grant funding, Jay Benicki. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. This is uh, a recap of what we presented at the last meeting with one slight change over it. Basically, the $2 million of grant allocations done through ARP funding done through the Council. Uh, this awards the last $676,000 to the various agencies that are listed below. One agency, Summit Counseling, we've had discussions with them, and it's not that they don't want to do the work, it's they can't hire the therapist to do the work, so we're decreasing theirs and reallocating it to the others. The change from the last one is I failed to mention that two of the agencies are not getting renewed, and I just wanted it to be clarified for the record that we're still going to work with them. We just don't need to extend the contract. We just need to provide final audits as this year wraps up, and that's the only change from this item from the previous discussion. Anybody have questions? Move to approve. Move by Stacy. Second. Second by Joe. Any further discussion? Thank you, Mr. Vinicky, for leading this effort over the last nearly four years. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. And and the entire staff. It's a lot of work. It's, of course, it's not quite finished yet. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, this passes you Congratulations, Mr. Walker. We're very proud of you, and we will miss you. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. It was so hard. Our decision. I, I love the city and everything we've accomplished over 13 years. So I appreciate that opportunity. Um, the agenda item I have tonight is the approval of the contract amendment with low engineers. I, I came to the last meeting uh, to present and discuss 
uh, the opportunity to create the full-time recreation leader and the full-time uh, operations associate. The two positions were already funded in the 2024 budget, uh, which, which necessitates the contract amendment with Lowe to provide those services. Um, based on some of the conversation we had at the last meeting, I met with uh, Student Manager Linton uh, and discussed our plan of action to provide additional customer service during rental procedures and things like that with these new positions. Uh, I think we have a good plan. Uh, the new full-time rec leader will be basically a rental liaison for the city. They will onboard everyone through the permitting process of renting the facility, uh, meet them on site, walk through the location, discuss what can be provided and what's not available and what is possible in the rental space um, to make sure that all the special event permitting process is clear and accurate as it comes in. Uh, and then from there, our maintenance staff will be there at 7 a.m. to open any gates, check the facility to make sure it's clean and ready at the beginning of any rentals. And then the part-time recreation leader staff, the three part-time positions will be the on-site uh, staff person to assist with during the event of whatever's happening. Uh, so we've kind of got multiple layers to help facilitate all of these rentals and special events uh, requests that we're getting. So um, with that, I'll open up any questions that y'all have. You back questions? Sorry, I forgot to ask. Stacy. This is the operations associate request, and then you have the facilities associate job description. Those are the same person, right? They're just not titled the same on our agenda. I apologize. Yes, that's okay. Project. Just making sure. Okay. Yeah. That I'm doing it apples to apples. Yeah. Okay. Um, I missed that in the job description. The business My item. Anybody else? All right. This is an action item. Move to approve. Moved by Tom. Second. Second by Rob. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, this passes unanimously. Thank you, Brent. And you're here for the next one. Yes. Um, I'm very excited to bring this to the city tonight. Um, as most of you saw in our memo, that our agreement with uh, Senpai Skateboarding LLC ended this past October for the concessions uh, and uh, upkeep of the skate park facility at Brook Run. Uh, we put out a request for proposals. We received five. Uh, the review committee scored them out individually, then met as a group and uh, made the unanimous decision that uh, Action and Adventure uh, had the uh, highest scoring proposal and offered the city the best benefit uh, going forward at that facility. Uh, Mr. Elliott Smith and Anthony Wells are here tonight with Action and Adventures to answer any questions that y'all might have of them. Uh, but really the thing that stood out about their proposal is their uh, experience working with youth uh, through the YMCA and their proposal of uh, adding additional programming elements to that facility other than just concessions and skateboarding. Uh, they've got a lot of experience working uh, with youth in after school programs uh, and community uh, engagement. So uh, that was really kind of the tipping factor as to why we wanted someone like that in that facility. I think it can be more than just a skate shop. I think it has an opportunity to learn a lot in the community, uh, especially with that, uh, the group of children that we have, our young boys and girls that come over to uh, the skate park. So with that, we'll open up to any questions and they're also here to answer any questions y'all might have. Yeah, John. Uh, thank you, Brent. I've uh, taken a look at the proposal and um, I'm happy with what I see. I was just hoping for more. I guess I'm looking, that's a huge building and uh, I know it was built out. What are, what are the possibilities to increasing the concession? What concessions are you having? Are you going to have coffee in the morning? I see you're closed at lunch. Mm -hmm. I was hoping for basically a business or a shop or something to be open to provide services to the thousands of people that go in and out of that park every day. And maybe that's not your business model, but I was hoping for something more than just a skate park operator. I was looking for a concessionaire. Is there any way you can explain to me what you plan on doing? Yeah. How you doing, guys? Thank you for having me here. Uh, yeah, so um, the model that we have, actually, I'm looking at running 10 hours, 10 hours a day out of there. Um, okay. At noon, I don't, maybe that was an error or something. I'm not sure with that. Maybe um, I missed it. Maybe I'm wrong. It says, I'm just looking at it. It says 8 to 1 and then 2 to 6. Okay. 
Okay. Hello, my name is Elliot Smith. So uh, I, I want to comment on that. The reason I chose that hour, because I'm just thinking about a time that it'll be kind of slow and no one will be there at that time to come in for lunch. So I'm thinking between eight and 12 is your time for your coffee and your lunch. And then you got a break for an hour to give our staff member the time to just recoup and come back. And then we got two to six, which is our peak hours for our after school program and everything else that'll be going on. Okay. Thank you. I just, I'm trying to understand what that's a big old building at a decent price that you're getting it for. What services are you providing? Not only the skaters and the protection of them, but the community as a whole, what services are you providing to the mom that has some kids in a stroller and over at the playground, which is a quick walk to your facility. So I'm just trying to understand yes. what services are you providing above and beyond skate park users, I guess. All right, glad you asked that. Actually, I thought the same thing when I saw it and I was like, wow, this can be used for just more than skating. So what I put together is um, I actually have some senior programs that I would like to implement. And the idea of the senior programs is to kind of give activities to seniors the same way that I would do with youth but it would just be a little bit different, giving them the opportunity to, to uh, mingle with each other and socialize, and at the same time, challenge themselves with like crossword puzzles, bingo, stuff of that nature. But at the same time, I'd, I would also like them to get a chance to walk around the park and do things inside of the park. I do look at partnering with the different amenities inside the park to bring just a bigger experience to everyone. With that being said, as you know, uh, Mr. Elliott just told you guys about the after school program that we also want to implement, and these will be running daily. Uh, another thing that I would like to do is add birthday party packages to this, where families can come out and celebrate their birthdays. We'll just provide the venue, the activities, stuff of that nature. During the daytime, I would like to have staff that could just be there someone skating hey you need some help with skating or if there is a parent that has a lot of children and they're kind of just running around doing anything we can add a little bit more structure by having somebody available to come up and say hey would you guys like to do this or do that we can provide different activities so i have a lot of ideas with just keeping something running at the park and let it instead of leaving it just dormant so we have a lot of activities all day long as far as concessions go uh we're looking at starting with like nachos and hot dogs, uh, popcorn, just regular con concession stuff, stuff that's also easy to package and put together and stuff of that nature. Um, other than that, yeah, that's, every, ideas are still going. We're still open to any ideas as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for coming forward. You know, I've been in just a community volunteer. Of course, it's always, um, you you wanna do something, do something well, under, under commit and over deliver, right? And so on. So obviously, I hope that, you know, crawl, walk, run, get a good, you know, you want to have good, you know, start with what you can get good feedback and then build upon it versus trying to do everything at once. You know, I'm just talking um, concessions. though, that is a, that is a nice one when you know, you're going to have word of mouth. If you have something for adults, like I'm not saying make an espresso machine, having it, having it there, but you know, have, have, if you have some nice pastries or coffee or something else for, cause there are, they're just, they're not kids. They're not senior citizens, but it can be people in between too. just, just have that option for people to stop by there, sit outside. I don't, I don't, I haven't been inside the venue. Okay. And, and I know that um, if I'm an adult um, I don't know if there's opportunities to have, have like an, a little outdoor seating where you are sitting out there and enjoying the fresh air while just sitting there with some friends, having a coffee and having a pastry or something. So thanks. Yeah. Stacy, sorry. I didn't see. Um, yeah, I have, I have a couple questions. Um, and I guess whether it's Brent or, or, or you guys, I don't understand the financial structure. So I understand birthday parties. I have 12 birthday parties the next three weekends in my facility, Brent, who is earning that money? Who, how are we like what, what, what does this public private partnership look like and has the financial look for it? I, I don't understand. Like we get $350 a month. That's great. Birthday parties can generate a lot of revenue. And I don't understand if it's going to be remain free to the public, but we're going to have this programming. How do you have a paying customer versus a non-paying customer? Can you explain how this is all going to look? Sure. So this one is set up more like a traditional lease where they pay rent to the city. Uh, the biggest benefit the city gets out of this is oversight of the skate park is having you know, someone operating a business there that uh, can ensure that the 
patrons of the skate park are behaving properly, doing what they need to do uh, with the limited park staff and police staff right here. We can't be there all the time. So having someone there that's invested in the park, wants to keep it clean, keep it up, keep the clientele in line is a huge benefit to the city. So we can't give it to them for free because that would be a gratuity. So we do require them to pay rent, but we don't want to overcharge. We want to make sure that they're successful, that they have a good business. It is a draw to the park, provides good eyes instead of bad eyes in the park. So we've always been negotiable with what that rent is because we don't we don't want to overprice the um, the person that's going to provide that oversight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess then in the contract, number one, there was no background checks. And I know we require that of our athletic association partners. There was no reference to background checks. And if we're going to have these guys in our city park working with youth, I think that needs to be in there somewhere, somehow. We could do that. Um, and then I guess when you said, you know, eyes in the park, keeping it clean, I didn't really see that where they're responsible for X, Y, Z to do in the skate park, you know, in reference to those services either. So that pretty much comes with the nature of, of the partnership. They're not going to be successful if they don't have a decent facility, if they don't mm -hmm. upkeep it, if they don't keep the bad elements away, then good elements aren't going to come and purchase from them. So just the nature of the arrangement of them being in the facility necessitates it to be cleaner, nicer, well-maintained. They will notify the city if anything is a problem. They can also notify the police department in the evenings if there's a problem. So just by the nature of the arrangement, it'll improve eyes on the park and, and increase a, you know, visibility of the skate park. So then, sorry, I know I'm getting in the weeds. It's just, I mean, it's kind of what I do too. So in the contract, there's no given hours of when they have to be there. So if they're not there in the evening, then we have no eyes. So the part of the proposal had request hours, like how often they would be open and things like that. And so that was part of the scoring mechanism. How many hours a day would they be there? There were some proposals that were just mornings, some were just afternoons. So in the scoring mechanism, we we weighted all that as part of their proposal. Also in their proposal, there was a reference to exhibit exhibit A and exhibit B, and those were not there. So if we could get those two, I believe it was like the letterhead of the business and exhibit exhibit B was references. Okay. I'll make sure that's in the next packet. I might have more questions. Just there, there was just I, and I kind of get where we're going with this, it was just very, between the contract and the proposal was just very nebulous to me. Catherine. Are Action and Adventure operating out of any other locations? No, it's not. No, no, it's not. Not currently or not previously? Not currently. But previously you were at other? I was contracting. Yes, I was contracting outside of the city of Dunwoody. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you have some expertise with senior um, senior services? Volunteer services, yes. Um, I, let, I ask a lot of questions. And in my in my opinion, volunteering with them gives you a chance to actually get to know like, okay, this is what you guys like. This is what you don't like. This is the, so I, I just have volunteer experience. Okay. And then the question for Brent then is that uh, what, what do you foresee as, um, senior services that will be most beneficial to this? Are you guiding this a little? Sure. So we have, as y'all can imagine, a large senior contingency in Brook Run, especially in the mornings, on the trail and at the Dahl Park primarily. So part of our partnership with them would be to help guide some of that programming. We know more about where the people are than they do now. So it would be working, they would be working with our recreation staff through some of those things to get the best benefit from the population that's there, where to advertise to. We're going to help them with their engagement with the park patrons that come out there, particularly in the doll park and particularly on the trail. There's a there's a large opportunity out there to start kind of creating some groups mm -hmm. uh, that meet on a continuous basis at the skate park, get their refreshments, and then as a group walk, as a group, go to the doll park. As and from that, more programs are created. So it's it's an opportunity to, to create that uh, kind of synergy, if you will, of, of all the individuals that are coming out to the park. 
Yeah, that's great. I think offering this breadth of services is wonderful. So we look forward to that. Thank you. Rob. I'm just going to make an observation more than a question. Just this is a, a year to year, right? Okay. So yeah. it's pretty low risk. I mean, we can see what kind of ideas and concepts and how things work and revisit this in a year. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of excited about, you know, what, what we might change and what might be better out there. So I want to give a tiny bit of history about the skate park because John did it and he could have, but he didn't, which is when we took over Brook Run Park, the skate park was costing DeKalb County tens of thousands of dollars. There was a contract just to manage it of a $40,000. Right. Year. And what we have found, so we went away from the pay to play model, which is how they were sort of justifying the $40,000 was they were charging admission to really no, we've had different things at different times, but mostly zero supervision. The last time I was in your building, it was because there were children on the roof and I came in to ask someone to please, besides me, tell them to get off the building. Had a conversation with a woman whose skater cut her hand on the top of our amphitheater and was mad that we didn't modify the amphitheater. And I was like, well, your child shouldn't have been on top of the amphitheater. And so my number one priority for this contract is to assure as much as possible some level of behavior that we teach the people that are using the park, realizing that sometimes the culture of skate may be opposite of what I'm asking, that they skate in the skate park, that they don't skate where we say no skating, that they understand consequences because I would make it a swimming pool tomorrow. Brent would not like that. But I I just think that I would. I just think that I worry I worry about kids getting hurt. I, I worry about them dashing across peeler without looking both ways, skating across peeler. So what I'm hoping first and foremost of this contract is, is that we get some sense of this is a place in a park I'm going to be slightly careful. I'm not going to be on the roof of the building. No one's going to have to tell the mayor that there were children on the roof of the amphitheater. So that's my first priority for you. Everything else is gravy. My friends who are in the park would like to be able to buy a bottle of water, a cup of coffee. It probably doesn't even have to be great coffee. A snack for their crying toddler if they forgot something. Don't You don't have to overthink it yet. Let's get the basics down first, which is let's make it an asset so that someone can feel like they can bring their four-year-old to ride their little bike down the little thing, whatever you call it, without worrying about what's going on around them. Let's first make it a community asset. What I'd really like to see you do, and it sounds like you want to, is focus on youth, teaching kids how to skate, you know, Offering the after school programs, you know, the, the classes, you don't have to offer a full child care program, but offering the summer camps, you know, take advantage of kids interest in biking and the risky stuff and all that stuff and turn it into an this into an opportunity for you to develop programs for the youth and young adults. There was for a little while, remember, a girls skateboard program running out of there that was, I think, really successful. John spoke a minute ago about things that kind of disappeared. It'd be lovely to bring that back. Um, I think we had a really strong contingent there for a while, but I think part of it may have faded because of some of the whatever mischief going on at the park. And so to me, your first year, if what you do is give us a strong, because unlike some places where the skate park is unfenced and there's no building and it's just part of a park or it's by itself, this has sort of a place because it's fenced and it has a building with a roof. Um, and so I think that if you could take advantage of what of what's there, because it feels structured, to, to do the things for the youth, the, uh, the kids, keep them busy, that, that's all, if that's all you accomplish in my mind the first year. For the senior programs, Again, I only got as far as the concession stand the last time I was in there to say, please get the kids off the roof. And um, and so the, um, but if there's room in there, I don't see why we can't use the space sort of as we have our other spaces, partnering with 
providers, there are a lot of women and maybe some men who would like to play mahjong. You know, they're always looking for a space for bridge or mahjong. You know, I haven't, I don't know how many tables are in there or what's in there, but there's an opportunity to use that space with existing partners or partners recreation knows, but really focus on the kids, right? Focus on keeping these kids busy, focus on teaching kids how to use our asset, focus on teaching families how to, that want to skate together, how to skate, do the biking stuff, offer a place to get a bottle of water and you're ahead of the game. So thank you. Mayor, can I ask one yes. quick question? Yes. Uh, so Brent, I just want to make sure I, I understand this. Um, what I heard was there's going to be time to evaluate in this, it, it appears unless the city takes some kind of affirmative action, there's some renewable terms already built in. And the only termination would be at a certain period of time before each renewable period. Is that what you intended? I just want to make sure because that the term in here, that paragraph is kind of, and it's not your fault, it's been over lawyered as I read this, is a little awkward. Uh, do you want just a one year term and then evaluate, or do you want to have a period of terms and an option for the city to get out for convenience? Because there's no convenience based on the draft. So the the, the way it was originally drafted by uh, legal right. um, was that it would be a one-year term that would renew every year with a five-year term limit. You couldn't renew it again after the fifth renewal that it would have to go back out to bid. Right. Um, there was no opportunity. But there's also, I think, the intention here as I read this after hearing it, after you presented it, there seems to be a way that we're trying to get for the city to be able to get out of it. Grimmish shall automatically renew for additional one year terms unless the city have done what he chooses to terminate this agreement pursuant to the provisions of this agreement by giving written notice to the company not later than 30 days prior to the conclusion of the initial or renewal renewal terms. The total renewal terms of this agreement shall be no more than five calendar years. I would rather that be annual deals, right? Not five years. It could go up to five years, right. but each renewable term is a 12 month okay. period. That so that the, the city could give notice within each 12 month period, right. rather than if they don't, we don't do it in the first year. Is it a five year deal? Or is it a five successive one-year deals? I think what I hear is five successive one-year deals right. after for a total of five years. Is that right? Right. So I think we need to work on that language in this okay. a little bit, especially when there is no, I just point out, there is no termination for convenience. It would only be a termination for cause. That would be a grounds for a termination con for convenience. Because it sounds okay. like everybody wants to evaluate how does this work. Okay. They probably do, and we probably do too. Is that what we're trying to do? Yeah. Right, and and that was the intent. Is it would be when it renews for the next year, all the terms start over again, and then at the end of that year, the clock starts again with the same right. terms in the lease. So it's not five additional years. I, I think we probably need to work on that That's paragraph right. a little bit, if you don't yeah. mind. Sure. So just bring it back yeah. if you can get it done in two weeks. Otherwise, just that. bring it back whenever. All right. Thank you all very much for being interested and we look forward to seeing what you can do. All right. Um, one second. I got you one thing. Um, public comments. I don't, I think the public has left or is leaving now. Um, anybody, uh, city manager comments, Eric? Uh, yes, mayor. I do want to just take this opportunity to thank Brent for his long tenure with the city of Dunwoody and, uh, sad to see him go, but I'm excited for his opportunity as with the city of Sandy Springs and uh, he won't be far away. I told him he's got to be within reach in case we need to grab him for a few right. minutes or kidnap him for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, Brent, uh, thanks for all your service with the city. 
and I appreciate you. And then I know you got one more meeting here. We can uh, kind of roast you a little bit more. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, council comment. Oh, no executive session. Correct. Here. Okay. Council comments. Anyone? All right. Seeing none. I need an emotion for adjournment. Move to adjourn. Move by Rob. Second. Second, second by Joe. All in favor, say aye. 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 We stand adjourned. I wonder where my cord is. Yeah.